Hello, I'm Tom McRae. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, the world's population is shrinking rapidly, but a baby boom is predicted for many developing nations. How will the demographic shift affect the global economy? Cracking down on the tech monopolies, US and EU regulators take aim at tech giants. Are they crushing the competition or staying ahead of their rivals? Women wanted for technology jobs. The gender inequality gap in the sector is narrowing across advanced economies. But when will it be bridged? It's been described as a demographic catastrophe. The Lancet Medical Journal warns that a majority of countries do not have high enough fertility rates to sustain their population size by the end of the century. And the rate of the decline is uneven, with some developing nations seeing a baby boom. The shift could have far-reaching social and economic impacts. Massive population growth since the Industrial Revolution has put enormous pressure on the planet's limited resources. So how does the drop in births affect the economy? We will dig more into this with our guests, but first, let's have a look at what is the fertility rate. It is the average number of children born to a woman in her lifetime. To maintain stable population numbers, countries need a rate of 2.1 children per woman, a number called the replacement level. Now, globally, the fertility rate has more than halved over the past 70 years, from nearly five children for each female in 1950 to 2.2 children in 2021. It will continue to drop to 1.59 by the end of the century. Now, that is below the replacement level. Three quarters of nations are projected to fall below that level by 2050. Now, by the end of the century, that will be the case in 198 out of 204 countries, meaning the population will be shrinking in almost every single country in the world. But the rate of decline is uneven. The share of the world's births in low-income regions will nearly double to 35% in 2100. Sub-Saharan Africa alone will account for one in every two children born on the planet by then. Now, only six nations, Samoa, Somalia, Tonga, Niger, Chad and Tajikistan, are expected to have fertility rates above the replacement level. Well, the UN says the global population, now at more than 8 billion people, will peak at nearly 10 billion in the mid-2080s. Well, joining us now from Vienna in Austria is Klaus Predner. He is a professor of economics at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. Thank you very much for joining us here on Counting the Cost. Now, Klaus, this has been described as a demographic catastrophe. Can you just put into context how large a problem this is? Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I would say that for moderately low fertility and a moderate population decline, it's not so much of an economic problem. There are many mechanisms that can compensate for low fertility, for example, a better education of the population, investments in technologies such as labor saving technologies, automation, industrial robots, and so on. And the country can also increase labor force participation rates of women and of older workers. And some countries can also compensate to some degree by having immigration. That said, a very low fertility rate for a prolonged period of time, coupled with outward migration, particularly of well-educated uh, individuals, that can really pose a huge economic problem for a country. And there are some countries in the world that face exactly this um, yeah, composition of problem. the problem. Yeah. Uh, I guess, can you just help explain why fertility rates uh, are dropping in some countries and increasing in others? And, and which countries in particular are m most at risk of this? Yes, so the fertility rates in the past have been falling for a lot of different reasons. Uh, most important ones were that uh, ed, uh, for parents it became more important to invest in education of their children such that the children have success on the labor market and that of course increases the cost of having children and parents had fewer of them. Female labor force participation rates increased which also increased the cost of having children, the opportunity cost of having children. Fertility norms changed so that um, family uh, families, uh, family norms for smaller families were um, more prominent and so on. And in uh, many countries, this reduced fertility rates to a large degree. In some other countries, fertility rates fell much later. Uh, so they are not increasing, but falling at a low, slower base. 
And of course, that leads to a situation where we have differential uh, growth rates of the population across different uh, countries. Mm. Uh, countries that are particularly um, susceptible to demographic changes are uh, South Korea and Japan in uh, Asia with very, very low fertility rates, and Eastern European countries that had a lot of outward migration over the last uh, two decades, particularly. Just on South Korea and Japan, what are those two countries doing in particular to try and combat this? Yes, so um, first of all, uh, these countries also do not have a lot of immigration. So that's one of the um, aspects uh, where other countries try to compensate for falling population uh, levels. And uh, But these countries invest a lot in new technologies. For example, Japan and South Korea are at the forefront of the adoption of industrial robots. And that helps them to cope uh, a little bit with uh, the falling number of workers on the labor market. Now, you touched on this uh, earlier. So Slightly, but I would like you to expand on it if you could. You know, as countries get richer and more educated, can you explain how fertility rates drop and, and exactly why that is? Yes. So if countries um, so if countries get richer, then it becomes more important uh, for the children to compete on the labor market to have a very good education. That the, the countries become more sophisticated in terms of their technologies and so on. And so parents um, put more emphasis on the education of their children. And that, of course, leads to a situation where having many children becomes very expensive. So you cannot send uh, seven children to university. So most of the families could not afford that. So that's one of the uh, reasons why fertility rates uh, fell. But also there are increases in female labor force participation in the richer countries. And of course, that makes it more difficult to reconcile career with uh, having children for women, particularly in the past. Now that is changing a bit, uh, since these countries also invest a lot in public child care and so on and so forth. But in the past, that was also a reason for having decreasing fertility rates. Um, then, as I said before, um, changing fertility norms. So a few decades ago, there was a norm of having larger families, basically, and this norm changed. And now it's more the case that families um, have two children and some even have uh, fewer children than two. And these norms changed quite a lot over time. Mm. And there are many other reasons as well. For example, uh, in the past, uh, children were also a little bit like a social security um, for the parents. So they cared for them when they were old and there were transfers later on instead of a, a working social security and pension system. And since richer countries implemented such systems uh, more formally, there was less of a need to have many children's, children that would care for their parents when they are old. And uh, many of the, there are also many other reasons um, that led to such a decline in fertility. But now it's kind of changing a little bit again. So now it's the case that um, high income people in high income countries start to have higher fertility rates again. And the main reasons are that it becomes more affordable for them to have uh, private child care and that the child care system or the public child care system is also uh, better developed now. And also fathers are more involved in, uh, in child care. And all that leads to a situation where particularly um, high income and well-educated women uh, have um, an easier time to reconcile family and uh, having uh, so uh, career and having uh, children than it was, uh, say, 10 or 15 years mm. ago. Mm. Changing very, very quickly. Uh, finally, are there any benefits to declining fertility rates? Particularly very high fertility rates are uh, problematic from an economic perspective. So very high fertility rates can lead to a situation that the country is caught in a poverty trap. So if families are very large, then uh, a lot of resources have to be invested in children and education of these many children is typically uh, lower than education would be uh, of the children if the families were smaller. And this sustains poverty in countries with very high fertility rates. So there is definitely a positive effect from going from very high fertility rates to uh, lower fertility rates. And even uh, below replacement fertility can have positive effects. Uh, so fast population growth is a drag on resources and um, uh, lower population growth leads to a situation where people tend to be better educated. You have more investments in new technologies, typically mm. in countries where the workforce growth is lower. And all that can have beneficial effects on economic outcomes and on economic growth. Um, but again, um, this is not the case for very, very low fertility, because of course, if the fertility 
liquidity rates are stuck at very low levels for a prolonged period of time, then countries can um, get into economic troubles. Yes. We'll have to leave it there, but uh, we really do appreciate your time and insight. Klaus Predner, Professor of Economics at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. It was nice talking to you. Antitrust regulators on both sides of the Atlantic are moving to rein in the power of tech giants. The firms are accused of building closed ecosystems around their products, making it difficult for users to switch to rival services. Now, regulators are now targeting the so-called walled gardens to encourage competition. The US has sued Apple for allegedly monopolising the smartphone market. And the EU is probing Apple, Alphabet's Google and Meta over uncompetitive practices. Well, we begin with this report from Victoria Gatenby on the challenges faced by Apple. Apple Chief Executive Tim Cook in Shanghai opening the second largest Apple store in the world. There was no sign of the pressure he was under as events were unfolding back home in the United States. We allege that Apple has consolidated its monopoly power not by making its own products better, but by making other products worse. As examples, the government's antitrust lawsuit points to the Apple Wallet payment system and the Apple Watch. Both interface only with the iPhone, while competitor watches and digital wallets face Apple-imposed barriers. And when it comes to Apple's messaging service, the company is accused of gumming up photos and videos exchanged with non-Apple devices. Phones at this point are basically mini computers, but on your laptop, you can install many things and you can decide to do it. The fact that you can't do that on your phone is a problem. And the fact that Apple does it so that they can lock in bigger prices uh, for themselves is a problem. In a statement, an Apple spokesperson said the Department of Justice lawsuit sets a dangerous precedent and hinders the company's ability to innovate. Others say the timing of the lawsuit is suspicious. It's a sort of easy political win. And we have an election in 2024 in the US, uh, Biden matching up against Trump. And I think the Biden administration uh, wants the agencies to have a case against um, these large companies so that they look like they're doing something about them. iPhone users in Berkeley, California, welcome the lawsuit and hope it leads to lower prices. I feel like it's absurd how high something that we utilize and honestly need, like a lot of us need them for our professional lives, for our, you know, school lives, for our everyday lives. The U.S. lawsuit joins other investigations into Apple. Regulators in South Korea and the Netherlands have prosecuted the tech giant for abusing its market dominance. And the European Union fined Apple nearly $2 billion for unfairly favoring its own music streaming service over rivals. Valued at around $3 trillion, Apple's annual revenue is greater than the gross domestic product of more than 100 countries. If the US government wins its antitrust case, it could lead to the breakup of Apple for the benefit of consumers. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera, for counting the cost. The EU is investigating Apple, Alphabet and Meta for potential violations of the bloc's new competition law. The Digital Markets Act requires six tech giants to open up their platforms and provide smaller rivals access to their users. Now, that could affect app stores, messaging services, internet search, social media and online shopping. Violations could result in fines of as much as 10% of the company's global annual revenues. Now, three other companies have obligations under the new law. They are Amazon, Microsoft and ByteDance. Tech giants have already announced some changes to their business practices to comply with the bloc's new rules, but regulators say they did not go far enough. Well, to discuss all of this, uh, joining me now from Berlin is Frederica Kalfenau. She's a tech policy expert. Thanks again for being with us on Counting the Cost. Uh, first of all, if we can start with the antitrust case against Apple. Now, the US government is going after one of the largest and most powerful companies in the world. Just how big a deal is this? This is a very big deal, and it sends a very positive signal, not just to consumers, but also to app developers globally. I think what's very important here is that you cannot see this case in isolation. It's part of a wider push of the U.S. government that started in 2019 
And there are ongoing cases against Alphabet, against Amazon, against Meta. So this isn't in isolation. What has happened in the last two decades is that in the absence of regulatory action, we have allowed tech companies to amass unprecedented power. And that's a real risk for innovation, for consumers, for prices, but also for the future of technology. So a big deal and a very positive signal. Mm. Uh, Apple's argument, though, is that it uh, tightly controls its ecosystems to help protect its consumers. Uh, are regulators going too far here? Um, not at all. First of all, we have to see what the outcome will be. Breaking up Apple is on the table, but that may not actually be the desired outcome. Apple brands itself as a company that prioritizes privacy and security. And to an extent, that is true. Apple has taken um, the FBI to court over backdooring uh, its systems. Apple has also successfully um, stepped in where regulators have failed. So Apple has pushed back against highly invasive third-party tracking on apps. All of these things are very positive, but they're also just half of the story. What the DOJ alleges is that Apple is very selective in where and how it protects consumer privacy. And a really good example is China. So Apple is active in China mm -hmm. uh, and Apple has um, ceded to power from or pushbacks from the Chinese government to remove VPNs, for example, from its app store. Uh, and they're also all cloud services in China are also backdoored. So this is a selective uh, treatment of privacy. The EU, uh, as we mentioned, is also trying to crack down on the big tech companies. Can you just break that down for us, their, their investigation, and exactly what regulators in the EU are trying to do? So that, that may come as a surprise to people, but the EU is actually a bit behind in the US when it comes to competition. The Digital Markets Act uh, is designed to rein in platform power, but the verdict is still very much out on whether it will be effective. What we have seen so far is that the Commission has designated six companies as so-called gatekeepers. We have now seen that these companies have somewhat reluctantly made some changes. For example, Apple now allows uh, apps to be purchased outside of its app store. That's a first and only in the EU. Uh, but what the Commission is doing now, it is probing these companies' compliance. That's a lengthy process that will take up to a year. Mm. So we have to see what will come out of it. Yeah, I guess how far are regulators prepared to go here, do you think? Or how far do you think they should go? Should we see a breakup of some of these massive companies? What's really fascinating is that the DOJ has called this case against Apple historic and draws a parallel against the famous case against Microsoft in the 90s. Uh, the DOJ really argues that what's at stake here is the future of technology. And the argument is that Apple has moved from innovating the smartphone market to stalling innovation. And the government sees a need to step in in order to create the conditions in which we can see more exciting products, uh, more apps uh, and cheaper phones. Okay, so just on that point, uh, Frederica, will any of this, I mean, how likely is it that we are actually going to see, as consumers, likely to see lower prices? Uh, look, I think what's a bit confusing about this case is that Apple has a very strong brand. People love iPhones, uh, but that's really not the issue here. The issue here is that Apple has monopoly power. It's that it is using the power to extract money from consumers and developers and content creators, and that Apple has engaged in exclusionary and anti-competitive conduct to maintain its monopoly. Mm. So this case is very technical, but the consequences may be very beneficial for consumers who may see more innovation, more choice, lower prices. And then the second audience of this is really app developers who have been forced to play by rules that primarily d benefit Apple. Mm -hmm. uh, so we may see different apps, we may see cloud apps, we may see more gaming apps. At least that is the hope of this case. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. But uh, as always, we really do appreciate your time and your insight. Frederica Kaltenauer, tech policy expert. Thank you. Thank you. Well, from lecture halls to offices, men outnumber women in the technology sector. The gender gap in the digital workspace is significantly wider than in other industries. But according to a recent report, the disparity has narrowed across advanced economies since the start of the pandemic more than four years ago.
Well, joining me now from Preston in the UK is Adrian Wright. He's the Associate Dean at the School of Business at University of Central Lancashire. Thank you so much for being here with us on Counting the Cost. First of all, traditionally, why has the tech industry been dominated by men? I mean, and why is the disparity, I guess, wider than in many, many other large industries? Hi, Tom. Yeah, um, the tech industry has been dominated by men a long time, uh, for a long time. And these are really long-standing issues in the sector. And it roots down to things like education and having that talent pipeline going through from um, early years education all the way through to employment, but also things like pay and inhospitable workplace cultures mm. um, that are more geared towards men than women. I guess, what are big companies actually doing to, to try and encourage more women and I guess universities and educational facilities doing to encourage more women into the sector? Yeah, so lots of organisations are, so are organising their equality policies to support more women in the workplace. And there's lots of frameworks and membership groups um, that work towards um, helping equality and diversity in the tech sector. Alongside that, companies are working harder on, um, on their practices and workplace cultures. Learning from things like Me Too and Gamergate in the games industry, mm. um, really to provide more hospitable environments for all employees. Um, but we need to do more, and we need to do more, particularly around workplace culture, progression, and retention to help deal with the gender gap in the sector. Yeah, as we mentioned, the gap is narrowing, but in the US it's still 35%, and EU is only 25% of women make up uh, jobs in, in the industry. What specifically, what actually needs to happen to, to, to turn that around? Well, clearly, uh, as you highlighted, the tech sector's gap is larger than lots of other different um, industries and sectors. So the tech industry really needs to continue to work hard to solve that issue. And we've learned a lot from COVID. Things like flexible work policies really help, but we need to make sure that those flexible work parts, uh, practices don't have unintended consequences. For example, um, remote working is now seeming to fade away a little bit where organisations are trying to get their workers back into the office. Uh, home working, for example, really provides accessible work um, for women, for example, who may have caring responsibilities. Also, we need to think about other things such as part-time work. So uh, are people undertaking part-time work getting the same opportunities in terms of training and progression? Retention is a really key issue um, in the sector for females. The females leaving the sector at, say, age 35, so that really needs to work hard on how those policies and practices that organisations are doing and have been doing, particularly since COVID, are actually working and being maintained. Mm. And we're also seeing mass layoffs uh, in the tech industry. Are women more at risk of losing their jobs than men? Yeah, again, it's it's a really worrying thing, particularly when um, we want more inclusivity in technology. Um, we know that women leave the sector earlier than men. We know that there's a pay um, disparity between men and women in the tech sector. And we also know that it's really, really important to have diversity and inclusion, not just from a point of principle and ethical reasons, but it's better business performance as well. So we need to make sure that women stay in the sector and when things like job cuts are happening, that the, um, the, the, the fair and equitable decisions are being made. OK, thank you. We'll have to leave it there, but we really do appreciate uh, your time and insight. Adrian Wright, Associate Dean of School of Business at the University of Central Lancashire. Thank you. Thank you. Bangladesh's state-owned company, Petro Bangla, has called for international bids for oil and gas exploration in the Bay of Bengal. That's as the country looks to increase its domestic energy supply. The bidding is for 24 offshore blocks. Tanvir Chowdhury has more from Dakar. Far below these waves in the Bay of Bengal could lie rich deposits of oil and gas. As one of Asia's fastest growing economies, Bangladesh aims to harness any untapped resources to bolster its energy supply. Now it's looking for investor beyond its border to explore and help develop what's beneath the seafloor. The geologists tell us all the major basins, they tend to be very rich in um, fossil fuel and mineral resources. So we also hope that's true, to make it very attractive for the international oil companies. They have been absorbed of certain liabilities of taxes and others. 
The energy minister says many companies are interested. The main challenge is how fast I can bring this gas to the people, to the investors, to the industries. That is the main challenge. That means we have to do a lot of infrastructure. infrastructure. We have to invest billions of billions of dollars. And also I have to keep the cash flow going on. Despite settling maritime boundaries with Myanmar and India years ago, Bangladesh's offshore areas remain largely unexplored. It operates 20 gas fields, but most will be depleted by 2033. In recent years, Bangladesh has been struggling to pay for imported oil and liquid gas due to depleting foreign currency reserve and rising local demand for energy. To address the energy gap, the government is inviting foreign companies to bid for offshore exploration contracts. So far, the government has invited 55 international companies to explore 24 blocks in the Bay of Bengal. Bangladesh will take between one and two-thirds share of profits, and it's offering production sharing contracts, or PSCs, that link gas prices to market forces and will allow companies to take their profits abroad without paying bonuses or royalties. Petro Bangla set the general condition of the PSC, such as the gas price, has been linked to the international index. Profit sharing now based on the product, not production, now the profitability. Some environmentalists say extracting gas could create methane emissions and damage the marine environment. But analysts argue major discoveries could boost Bangladesh's economy and reshape its standing in the region. Well, that is our show for this week. Get in touch with us on X, formerly known as Twitter. I'm at Tom McRae underscore NZ. And do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or you can drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That will take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. Well, that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Tom McRae from the whole team here. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is coming up next.